I want to thank everybody that is helping us make this successful and has come to hear Ben Connors talk about Scan Your Passions, blending X-ray CT scanning technology with personal interests. I'm Karen Brewer coming to you live, live, live. And this is George Hodges coming to you also live. And of course, our guest speaker, Ben Connors. Ben, thank you so much for agreeing to do this for us today and to help share your knowledge and to help the community grow in their knowledge level and technology use and skills. So um, everybody understand, please, that we have all of the chats and all of the volumes turned off. Ben will be the only one allowed to speak during this time. At the end of the presentation, we will open it up for questions. Most of you will have your systems automatically unmute your mics. Uh, we have had some problems in the past with systems not allowing it through the firewalls or the bandwidth or whatever. Uh, so if you have a question at any time, put it in the chat box at the bottom and George and I will be monitoring that. And at the end, either George or I will read the questions. If you choose to put in an anonymous question, you can, but most of the time we will say who's asking the question and then let Ben have a chance to answer it. So without further ado, I hope that everybody, including me, has their phones muted. <laughs> Let me mute mine before I'm the embarrassing one. Um, all right. So without further ado, Ben, please take it away. All right. Thank, thank you, Karen. Thank you, George. I'll just share my screen here in a, in a moment. How are you doing? Perfect. All right. Awesome. But yeah, George, Karen, thank you. Certainly appreciate you guys putting this together. Um, you know, and as as I get started, uh, you know, it's, uh, sometimes people do thank yous at the end, some at the beginning, I'll do my at the beginning. Um, but, you know, appreciate you guys having me on. Um, also want to credit uh, Justin, Mac, Jeremiah, uh, some some guys on our team here that really helped me put this this presentation together. I mean, they, they're doing all all the heavy lifting and I'm uh, just just delivering it. Um, Technology credits, so Nikon, Volume Graphics, uh, the whole Abonics team. Um, just, just want to say thank you to everybody because you know all of this is is certainly a team, team effort. And uh, called, I called George here uh, maybe forty minutes ago. We had a power outage, um, and so I was going to drive over to someone else's house so we could keep doing this. But power came back on. I'm back in the office, and away we go. Um, so with that overview, so what what we're going to be talking about today um, is, you know, I'll, I'll go, you know, brief company history, personal history, that sort of thing. X-ray and CT basics. I think most of the people logging in here know X-ray and CT, but sometimes with these virtual, you don't know who is logging in and starting to learn about X-ray. So I'll, I'll touch on that, but I'll, I'll kind of buzz over it. If I go too quick, you know, of course, you know, hit the chat and I can can slow down. Uh, enhanced technology. So, you know, what, what are some of the nuanced differences, uh, things that are new or at least newer, um, and then really get into the meat of it. So um, but I'll, I'll talk about it more as I go through the slides, but we have a project here, an activity called Scan Your Passions. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the physics of skiing, a failed uh, model train, a record player cartridge, and uh, the ring of death on an Xbox. So uh, what we do is we scan things in our lives that we're passionate about. Um, so we're mixing what we like to do outside of work with uh, X-ray inside. So we can talk about pixels and photons, but in the context of maybe a, a ski boot or, or a record rather than you know something benign and less interesting. So uh, for myself, intro and background, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but you know I've got a background in NDT. Uh, but first seven years of my career, uh, I spent as a as a technician. So it was, you know, UT, RT, MAG, Penetrant, CWI, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm pretty pretty familiar with with the NDT business. Uh, the following seven years, I joined uh, North Star Imaging as a salesperson. Actually, I think when I was first approached and asked to be a salesperson, I I kind of laughed and said, "Well, why would I do that? I have all these certifications." Um, but what I what I learned is in that that kind of a, an activity you can learn about new technology, see a lot of new places, um, and then the the following seven years roughly, um, I ran the inspection lab. Um, so I, I you know helped with expansion, you know adding new offices, new machines, um, you know different different programs that we ran there. 
So um, about the last four years, I've been at Avonics Imaging. Uh, so I lead our, our inspection services business here and, you know, working on expanding to, you know, different, different offices, different technologies, um, that sort of thing. So pretty much been in something X-ray or NDT my whole life. Um, so scan your passion. So talk a little bit about personal side. Um, first hobby. I don't know if wife and kids are really considered a hobby, but, you know, it certainly takes up a Incredible amount of time and is is certainly a huge huge blessing. Um, you know, one of the things we do as a family is we look to uh, we're trying to check off all the state parks in the state, and ones close to your house are really really easy to check off. And as they get to three, four, you know, five, six hours away, it's harder and harder. But it's certainly a, a family activity. Skiing, which I'll get to in a little bit, um, but liquid and solid. So in the summer, love to be on the water. In the winter, love to be on a you know hill or a mountain. Um, play a little sand volleyball, hunting and fishing, and uh, youth sports coach. So that's that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, Avonix history. So I'll you know kind of go through a little little bit of our you know company organization, who we are. Uh, so Avonix Imaging was started by Brian Ruther and Jeff Deem in 2012. And, you know, I won't read every single one of these blocks along the way, but it started as a scanning business. Um, you know, initial engagement was with, with uh, Nikon and eventually turned into a manufacturing business as well. Um, so along the way, there's CE certification, ISO, opening a new office, you know, adding team members, that sort of thing. Uh, in the, you know, in the near future, uh, we'll be announcing new, new machines or new styles of machines, that sort of thing. Um, we've got a new headquarters coming, um, as well as additional satellite offices. So that's that's kind of us us in a nutshell. Core competencies as a company. Um, I think uh, you know I don't know how many participants we have on here. Most people know this, but we do X-ray or CT as an inspection service, which is you know my team, uh, my my role, and you know so we have ASNT and as for ten. Uh, certified people, you know, level two and level three. We manufacture systems, uh, we're ISO certified, and of course we uh, repair and train and support what we build and create. Um, what motivates us? So this is a big one, um, and it, it seems to come up over and over and over again. Um, you know, when, you're, when we're looking to build a team, you know, Core values is really one of the key components. Um, you know, as NDT people, we often talk about certifications and qualifications and hours and all of this stuff. But, you know, a couple of years ago, as a, as a team, we went through, you know, what are our core values? What do we really, really want? So, uh, you know, we believe the goal, everything we do should result in mutual success for our company, employees, vendors, strategic partners, and most important, the customer. Um, and, you know, we, achieve that mutual success by challenging boundaries of human ingenuity, technology, x-ray products and services that we you know, provide or deliver. Um, and then that leads to you know, the quality and safety of the things that our customers do, whether it's a rocket, whether it's a heart valve, whether it's a car, you know, anyone in NDT, anyone in CT, you know, you're, you're looking at something really important. Right. And so we strive for that mutual success because everyone in that whole environment has to succeed. And so we have it summarized in uh, what we call ACE. So authentic, competent and empathetic. Um, so in authenticity, you know, show up joyful, humble, imperfect. You know, we actually had, had some spirited debate on imperfect. And I'm really glad that it's in there. Um, you know, if anyone wants to raise their hand because they're not imperfect, you know, let me know, I'll, I'll take your class. <laughs> um, you know, grateful to serve others. That That's really, really important to us. Competency, that's again, very, very normal to, to talk about. We talk about it in, you know, George and I've had long, long discussions on certification of people and as for 10, um, you know, can you make not just an image that you're asked to do, but can you make something beyond that? And you see a defect no one else can see. Um, so competency is really, really big. And then empathy, right? You know, if we've got a customer with a, you know, uh, a lying down, a situation where they're really in a, in a bad spot, you know, we need someone on our team that, that is empathetic to that, 
um, both to their teammates, but also their customer or whoever's in that that environment. So core values is really, really important. And it's a, a tool I, I wish that I had years ago. Um, and I'm really thankful we have it now. And so we do a core values day. So we go and race some go-karts. We put some uh, sandwiches together for homeless people or, or you know, different activities of that nature. Um, you know, it's kind of an annual activity, but you know, we should... Uh, you know, we should and do uh, talk about this on a daily basis, right? We use it in our hiring, um, unfortunately, sometimes in the firing uh, side of things, but, you know, you, you got to have those components to build a good team. Um, so that's kind of my obligatory who we are as a company um, stuff. Uh, so next is x-ray and CT technology. So our lab um, you know, I've just got a picture of our Minnesota lab. We've got another one in Texas as well. And I'm just doing this for context. So once, once we get to the systems, you can ask about what tube, what detector, that sort of thing. So total within the Abonics environment, we've got seven systems. We've got two uh, LES or large envelopes. So these are either uh, walk-in rooms or very, very large cabinets that I can stand in. Um, they're typically, we're going to have a 450 microfocus x-ray tube, a 225 uh, rotating target. Uh, 4343s, CLDAs, uh, granite base, you know, high precision, high end, high end X-ray. Um, we've got a couple of uh, uh, Nikon XTHs, um, pretty legacy workhorse type type systems. They're they're 225. Typically, we've got a, a rotating target as well as directional and sometimes a transmission interchangeable heads on on those. And then um, you know, we've got a, like I said, a, a couple of systems that we can announce soon. But we've got a, a Vonix uh, created uh, two two five with a Nikon RT directional and a forty three forty three with a granite base and an XTB one sixty. So that that's kind of the the tools that we use within that that X ray uh, environment. So what is X ray and CT? Um, and again, I'm burning through this pretty quick because I think we've got an educated crowd. Um, so X-ray and CT is a non-destructive imaging uh, method, which results in cross-sectional or volumetric data sets uh, revealing kind of that internal geometry. Um, I think we all know what the medical CAT scan looks like. So tube and detector spins around the body um, and you've got one center axis of, of rotation. And in the industrial world, we like to joke that uh, we don't care about our patients. Um, and so... In this case, the, the part rotates and tube and detector remain static for the most part. There's a you know a couple of technologies where that's not always the case, but for the most part, part spinning, tube and detector static. So um, and then the you know physical layout of that. So we've got um, basically a, an image of a system here. So on the left, we've got a, a detector. So very commonly, that's either a 4343 or a 1621, some kind of a, a way to receive the photons. Uh, lower down, we've got a CLDA or a curved linear diode array that's shaped to that, um, that uh, cone of radiation so that we would have the same ray length, whether it's on the edge or in the middle. On the right hand side, you know, just a couple different example x ray tubes. So, uh, uh, RT 450 or rotating target 450, a uh, static 225, and a mini focus 450. Um, so, that's that's the general layout of a CT scanner. Mm. Uh, once we would put, you know, a shell or some shielding on top of that, some people use a concrete bunker, others will have you know, some kind of a steel lead steel construction on the outside. So you got shielded doors that are interlocked. So if they, you know, open the door, unplug the x-ray, um, you know, radiation effects to specimens are pretty much always okay. Uh, there, there are some nuances. Typically it's space grade electronics or medical device electronics are the ones that um, there would be a concern. Uh, if we do run into that, you usually need to go backwards to whoever built that electronics or whoever's specking that out and they can articulate what kind of uh, dosage that that sample can take. But it's pretty pretty rare most of the time whoever's bringing a product like that in is gonna know uh, that it's radiation sensitive and that there's a concern. And then of course, a, you know, a shielded cabinet keeps us all safe. Um, so that's 
that's kind of the the geography layout so workflow so you know as you know parts process through an x-ray machine you know scanning and x-ray acquisition again fairly straightforward we just take you know 1500 maybe 3000 images as that part rotates a uh, pretty common uh, effort is to figure out Nyquist or figure out a, a, how many x-rays should I take based on what I want to see. Um, and sometimes you can pull that back if you've got RQIs or different different things like that 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 tell us I'm still seeing my defects and then you can speed up a little bit. Surface determination. So in certain cases, we'll do a CT scan and then compare that to a CAD model. So inside and out, I can see whether that, that part uh, fits both you know, from a defect perspective, but also from a metrology perspective. And that's, you know, kind of a big reason for granite. Um, so that was, that was kind of the basics or some of the basics. So what's the smallest defect you can see with CT, right? I, anybody that's experienced on this call has had that, that posed to them maybe in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so resolution X-ray and CT, it's complicated. Um, you know, sometimes people say it depends. So the three main factors that determine resolution of an X-ray image or radiograph is detector spatial resolution. Um, so smaller pixels, we get better resolution on paper, but smaller pixels are also less sensitive. It's a smaller photon bucket to receive that, that radiation and smaller pixels are more noisy. Um, geometric magnification is another factor, right? Um, and I'll, I'll get into each one of these. And then focal spot size. So um, the factor of the source energy and power and the higher the power density, typically the larger the spot. So if you want a really, really small spot, you typically have to turn that down. And I'll talk in a little bit about how to deal and manage with that. Um, but here's the basic math of geomag source spot size and spatial resolution. And a quick screenshot of a, a line pair. So you know, we would just image those those line pairs and see where where that both graphically and visually breaks down to detectability or lack of detectability. Uh, imaging resolution. So like I said, pixel size, smaller pixels, they're not always better. Now they can be, um, but they can also cause some challenges. Uh, one, one of the things is that scintillator has to get thinner. Um, as as our pixels get smaller because if you have a really thick scintillator there's a possibility of light landing on a pixel that we don't want maybe that that uh, isn't the best best of of process um it's got less active area uh so that means we'd have to basically let it soak or or light up longer um so more imaging time and then more pixels more problems so anyone who's gone from uh you know 200 to a 100 micron panel, or even you know, 200 to 150, you end up buying a lot of uh, back-end IT stuff to store more, to manage more, to transfer more. Um, so that, that can be a challenge. Um, so Geomag, again, I, I think we have mostly experienced people here, but you know, kind of lays out fairly simple. So um, if we've got an x-ray tube on the left, a detector or an image on the right, and we've got a sample in the middle, relatively low mag, relatively close to the, the panel. And then as we mag up, we can certainly increase that resolution. This is, you know, the purest or cleanest way to improve our resolution. It's just like in, you know, if you're taking a, a picture of something, you grab that lens and twist it. That is the most pure way to get, uh, um, magnification or, or a better image. But in this case, as we magnify, um, then we're not getting my whole part. I'm only getting an, an AOI or an area of interest of that part. Um, so source to detector and source to object distance is really the calculation. Pretty, pretty straightforward here. The, the way I like to think about it is tube to detector here and here. Halfway between is 2x mag. And every time I cut it in half, I double my resolution. So two four, eight, 16, on and on and on. And the image that, that we're showing, we'll flash that a little bit as we as we walk through here. So this is a, a sample that's not made for CT scanning at all. It's actually terrible. Um, you know, it's a, a 
little ink and L piece that's made for testing 3D printers. So they have you know, pins that stick up, holes that go down, steps, these different features, and they want to see if the printer works well. Um, so it translates well if you can CT scan something hard and see some void or defect or, or feature. Um, that translates very, very well, especially in the aerospace additive world where you know they don't make perfectly round things. You know they make all kinds of different shapes, and we're able to see some of these defects, and it helps helps when you're trying to prove out. Um, so not all mag is is equal. So remember in that calculation, focal spot size is one of the components, right? And so if we look on the left, a microfocus versus a mini, so a, a small very, very small spot, 450 versus a you know, relatively large, like a, um, you know, 400 microns, pretty common. And, and each of them have their own place. It's not a good or bad. It's just a, you know, technical difference. Um, but in the, the micro focus, um, and I'll show this in a few different examples, but in the, the, the DR, we can see all five of the pins and holes. Uh, in the mini, we can confidently see three. And if you stand back far enough, you can debate the fourth. Um, so same detector, same mag. The the main difference is, uh, you know, in school, what they referred to as the UG factor, geometric unsharpness. So that's just the, the physical focal spot size, the penumbra effect, uh, as well as that that magnification. So that's a consideration that that all of us need to keep in in mind as we're using geomag you might want to drive that tube a little bit harder wattage wise but um, regardless of the tube or tube style as we drive that wattage uh, that that spot size has to grow or we're going to have an electron beam welder um, so and we don't want that um, so the easy concept to kind of communicate in layman's terms is a candle versus a window so a, a point source versus a large light source and the edges of that hand being fuzzy. Um, and then resolution and CT. So we CT scan that NIST sample. And on the right, we're showing a um, three out of the five. And on the left, we're showing five out of the five um, features that we wanted to see in there. So again, that was you know more of the, the simple end of, of X-ray and CT. Um, some of the enhanced stuff. So I, I mentioned some problems and maybe how we can get around some of those problems. So one of the challenges in, in X-ray, and this is pure X-ray physics, is um, you know, we're, we've got a vacuum tube. We accelerate, um, uh, you know, we boil electrons off of a filament. They accelerate in the vacuum. They impact that target. And about 99% and change of, of that energy turns into heat. So we all have to manage that or, or deal with that. And the last, I don't know, 0.3% actually of energy turns into an X-ray photon. So in a static target, there's finite heat dissipation. And this is, you know, the, the physics are true regardless of whose brand name you, you would be talking about. Um, so if you want to crank up the KV, you'd have to have very, very, very low wattage um, because, you know, voltage and amperage equals, equals wattage. Um, and so one thing that's that's done differently, and it's done pretty commonly in the the uh, medical world, probably not not quite as much in the uh, in the NDT world, is a rotating target. Um, and so basically, if you're putting all of this energy into one very very small spot, um, you know the one of the ways to manage that is have that target spin. So now we're spreading that that heat or dissipating that heat throughout the, the rotation of the target. Um, and so that gives a couple of advantages on the high end. Um, you know, we can drive a 450 to a small spot size and see defects that, you know, maybe no one else is gonna see. On the, you know, on the 225 side, you know, what used to be an hour scan can now be 15 minutes, um, which is pretty pretty substantial. Um, and so the, the I've, alluded to this, but the typical reflection target, um, and, you know, we still use these today, you'll see in my, my examples, we, we absolutely use reflection today. Um, 
it's about one watt per micron. So the basic math is um, if you want to turn the KV up, you got to have very, very little flux, but we can, can squeeze that out. A rotating target is going to be about four watts per micron. So a 80 micron spot at 450. Um, another thing that's not talked about as much as the, the angle or the degree of uh, reflection. So that 45 degree angle actually increases brightness a little bit. So we're dissipating the heat, we're playing with the angle, and we're able to, to light up a detector very well. And um, so that the you know kind of general spot sizes, if, if you are trying to get your head around what, what is possible, you know, at, at uh, 450, 80 microns, 100 watts, that, that's what's published. Um, we've got some some pretty confident evidence that that we're down in the in the 50s there, um, but that's what we publish so that that you know that that that's what what the case is for sure. Um, at 450 watts, you'd be at about 113, and the 225, 10 at 30, and 160 at 450 watts. So, um, so that kind of gives you an idea of being able to do a scan differently. Um, couple of the other concepts and again this is you know some of these might be our trade names and I know other others have other other trade names but um, you know what we call helical is basically it's made for long skinny parts so you would uh, put a part in let's say a you know pen or maybe a baseball bat or something like that long skinny parts and when we talk about geometric mag a little while ago um, uh, you know, if I would mag up on this pen, I would only get the ball point at a, at a high mag. Let's say I'm trying to do a 10, 15 micron scan on it. Whereas with helical or some concept like that, you know, whatever, whatever brand name you would look at, um, you're able to spin that part basically like a, like a candy cane all the way up. And so we clean up some of these artifacts, clean up some of these defects, um, and you don't have to stitch anything together. So that's pretty select. We use it pretty often. Um, offset CT. So this basically just increases your field of view. So the, the bottom right to me is probably the most useful view of this. So the, the bottom right hand view would be x-ray tube sample detector. And, you know, we can go out to about half of that cone and spin the part because all that part goes all the way through and I know I think George might even have some some uh, teaching slides on this that you really only need about 180 degrees of rotation to get a good CT scan you know typically we do it for a lot of other artifacting and other other reasons but um, so anyways that that's kind of a slick one the the offset CT and uh, pixel push. So, you know, if you've got a, a spot size of a, of a certain amount and um, you're trying to squeeze out that last little bit of, of resolution for whatever the case may be, um, you know, and again, this is, uh, I think Nikon came up with this first, um, but, you know, there's, there's others in the market. Um, and so the, the idea of pixel push is basically that the panel moves, panel moves, panel moves, panel moves. And I think I've got an illustration here. So it's four CT scans, so it's pretty data intense. Um, but what we're doing is we're splitting those uh, pixels in half. And so if I would identify a, a defect, see if I can get my mouse moving here, identify a, you know, a dark or a light spot, you know, whether it's a defect or anomaly in this area, and it shows up only in that bottom corner, you would then have enough overlapping for that to light up and basically show. Um, you know, you've still got some, you know, issues with the detector. It's not a one for one. Like if you've got a 200 micron panel, you're not automatically at 100 microns. Um, but it does help to squeeze out a little bit more and does help to improve. Um, and then, of course, we check our, our panels. A lot of the aerospace work that we do, we're, you know, driven to, Test our panels, test our CT scans, test our people. You know, I mean, it, you know, when you're scanning things that fly, it's very, very important that we're confident on the the quality of our product and what what's happening there. Um, so that that's kind of the the X-ray bit of it, you know, the the technical bit of it. Now we can get into the fun stuff. Um, 
So like I had mentioned, we, we have a, a project internally called Scan Your Passions. So this is a series or an activity where anybody in the company right now, it's mostly been the guys in the lab, but you know, we have field service techs, we have manufacturing, we have engineering, um, you know, we have other people in our environment that don't do CT every day. And we want them to be involved. And you know, frankly, for me, uh, you know, I want our customers or other people to see CT differently, right? And kind of get excited about it the way I am. And so one idea that we had is that you can take your passion or your um, hobby or what it, whatever it is in your life, bring it in and scan it, and then talk about that. Because if I, um, you know, if I CT scan a circuit card and show it to an electronics person, um, they don't care about it unless it's theirs, right? And that's true for all of us. We all kind of have a, you know, what what's interesting for me kind of a hat hat on. And so what we did is scanned a few different things that that we thought were cool and that you know some of our people are are passionate about. So for me, it's skiing, right? I love love to downhill ski. So I kind of started searching for uh, pictures of skiing, and I you know had to. I wasn't sure if I could come up with something, but I did. So every weekend, every Saturday, I teach skiing. I teach little kids how to ski um, in a ski club. And, you know, so we show up on these little Midwest hills and with a bunch of buses and teach the little kids how to how to make a turn on basically Minnesota ice. Um, I have an app on my phone, tracks my runs and my speed and, and vertical and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, I do this with, you know, work friends and buddies. Um, we try and take cool pictures, take my kids out west. Um, you know, certainly looking for a powder day every single time we go out west. Um, that's a super cool picture of you know, just bumps covered in powder. That's you can kind of smash through. Um, put, you know, little mustaches on kids for a family fun day um, and on and on and on. So I'm, you know, kind of just trying to illustrate I'm absolutely passionate about about skiing and I certainly like x-ray this is a <laughs> a little chance to mix the two um so out of that we picked a ski boot to to CT scan so why do we choose a ski boot you know it fits as scan your passion goal um plastic foam aluminum steel all in one scan so it's a tough scan right um low density and high density that's a that's a hard mix and frankly, it allows me to Google uh, skiing stuff during during the day at work. So the physics of skiing. So if you back up a little bit, X-rays just applied physics, right? Um, skiing has a lot more to it than one might think. Um, you know, so we've got a snowy surface, we've got a slippery ski, we've got the angle of that that hill or that mountain, um, and you know, typically what we want to do you know i mean we rate the the angles of that you know green is for little kids skiing double black is expert you know um so there's different different hill ratings but you know ultimately the the physics of skiing is you want to make a turn as you're going down the hill um some of it is to control your speed but some of it is it's really fun right it's a uh, you know maybe analogous to a motorcycle on a curvy road, you kind of get that that pendulum feel in your stomach. And so there's a lot of physics that go into that, um, you know, from the, the steepness of the hill, the position of the skier, um, the engagement of the ski, which ski is engaged more, you know, in a, a really high carve, perfectly pure carve situation. When you're carved like this, that ski is bent backwards, almost like a Think of it as like a leaf spring. And as soon as you flatten it out, it's going to pop you and you should hit the next one. So if you see a you know, racer or you know, a video of someone skiing, um, that's like the perfect situation where the, the energy of that ski and the energy of that uh, gravity makes it really, really easy. Um, whereas a skidded turn uh, is a whole lot more work. Um, so the, the couple of things that we think about in skiing is center of mass, right? You know, so the three-dimensional balance point of, of an object in, in a skier, it's going to be your pelvis or hips, something like that. 
uh, and the base of support. So that refers to the area beneath an object, uh, you know, or a person. So every point of contact, um, you know, supports that surface, and you know, the the boots the most integral part of that. So if we apply this to you know to reality or to to action, the image on the left so that's a, a skier making a, a really hard cut in a slalom race and if you look at the snow coming off of the two skis the ski on the left actually has more snow coming off of it he's probably got about 90 percent of his pressure on that outside and the 10 percent is just a rudder or a guide on the inside um, and so if he's flexing that ski it's going to pop and he's going to bounce to the next one really really quickly the one in the middle looks like a middle-aged guy that's uh, probably not as aggressively forward as he could be, but he's probably having a good time on vacation. Um, and the one on the right is Teddy, our youngest. Hands out front. Ooh, good one, Tiny. All right, do it again. Good job. What's that? Good job. So the applied physics for those three people are the same. We're applying them differently. Teddy's got a little bit uh, lower, um, you know, uh, base of support or, or center of mass, um, but the, the physics are the same saying that the boot fit actually matters for all three um and so you know if we look at ski boots you know what are they made of um what what, what are we looking at there um you know they gotta manage cold temperatures um large forces uh you know i mean a, a ski racer can get upwards of 80 miles an hour a recreational skier it's not uncommon that they be 40 50 even 60 miles an hour um so they got to protect you um every motion that you make every engagement that you make if there's slop in that boot that's wasted energy and maybe even a wasted opportunity uh, depending on what you're trying to to do or maybe even avoid um so this boot doesn't have a perfect shape nothing does i mean it's basically rolled up plastic but you know if you unbuckle these these boots they'll kind of go like that over time and so we use panel shift helical uh, to be able to get that in a single pass uh, rather than multiple scans that would need to be stitched together. What are we looking for in CT? In this scan, honestly, mainly for fun, um, you know, but we're also looking at the, the liner to boot fit, um, the buckle, buckle construction. Um, one thing that's perplexed me for forever is the walk versus ski latch. <laughs> it, you know, and I think this is true in skiing, but it's true in golf, it's true in fishing, a lot of other other you know personal activities is they've got these little widgets and you're like, man, that looks cool in the store. And then you get it home and you're like, does it really work? And then you just move on with your life. So we'll talk about the walk versus ski latch, um, general defects, voids, cracks, things like that. Um, and then clues do a good fit. Um, so the the saying is the perfect boot. Uh, should be just like Pink Floyd, comfortably now. Um, so that that's really what we're looking for. So I've got a slice video here, and it goes a little bit quick. So sometimes I just feel better if I slice like we're slicing through VG. So in this case, this is just kind of the the bottom up or top down type of a view. Um, so we can see some of these different fitments. Uh, you know, if if we look way up at the top, I'm actually able to see some voids and defects in that little walk ski latch, um, and we can see how the how the buckles go together, how the liner goes in, all of that sort of thing. Um, honestly, probably the most fascinating one, but we can't do it because it's not, not safe. Would be buckle that on your foot and then take a look. Um, the next one here is just a, a side view of the same. Um, and there was actually something interesting here. So if we look at the bottom right on the heel, 
So you see how that liner has some space with the outside shell. Anytime you put on a ski boot, you should tap your heel about three, four times to get that heel all the way back. If you see that little cupped area, and it's kind of hard to get the boot on. So you want to tap that heel three, four times on, on the ground before you buckle up and it'll push everything back and it'll fit better. And it'll, it, it may seem like small movements, but it's the difference between being unbelievably tired or not at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, bottom up slicing and, and uh, slicing on the side. And then we just took a couple of screenshots. So we obviously had a, a stick in there just to just to kind of hold it up to do the scan. Um, and then a, a buckle. This is kind of interesting. So all those buckles, not all of them, but very often actually have a, a screw. So you, you know, if you latch something and this one's too tight, the next one's too loose, you can actually make a, a you know kind of a fine adjustment there. Um, and then just a we were hoping to find something. We did a high mag on just the toe, but it really wasn't anything too fascinating. So um, the technique info on the, the toe or the AOI scan, 220 KV, um, used a, a Varex 4343 and the Microfocus RT. Um, the helical scan, um, we just, for geography reasons, put it on a little bit bigger, bigger system, so 440. Um, uh, the 450 uh, RT, we certainly didn't need that for penetration. It was honestly probably just a bigger box. And then a 4343 panel. So um, the next Scan Your Passions one, this is Mac. Uh, so Mac is really into music and specifically uh, he's always been an enthusiast of records. So I didn't know this till we started our, our Scan Your Passions activity. But apparently digital audio files get compressed and make the files small enough to store, the part I knew, but the, the vinyl doesn't do that. And so there's little nuanced audio pieces that, that can be lost. Um, and so it's kind of turned into this cottage industry and cottage activity and Mac's pretty, pretty deep into it. Um, so, you know, the other big, big deal, I think, and again, um, probably dating myself, but, <laughs> um, you know, for for some of our younger employees or younger teammates, um, you know, the idea of getting a whole bunch of songs all, um, you know, the idea of getting a whole bunch of songs all in one place is, you know, that now, now it's cool again, I guess. Um, but so he, he buys these, um, and this is what he wanted to scan was basically the read head from that, that turntable. Um, the other thing is they have, you know, pretty cool artwork here. So I asked Matt to throw her back to throw a few of these together. So um, turntable cartridge. So it ended up being three separate scans, uh, you know, one as is, and then uh, one for the stylus, uh, and then, you know, kind of aligned everything all, all together. Um, you know, sometimes when you're, when you're scanning more for show and less from a technical perspective, you know, if you've got uh, plastic and metal together, you know, we're always going to get some level of streaking. You can get some of that out with software. We can get some of that out with filtering, with techniques, that sort of thing. But uh, in this case, it made sense to just, just pull them apart. So here's here's Max work and obviously did this in VG for anyone that's not, not as familiar with, with X-ray and CT. and his technique info. So the cartridge, uh, um, stylus and cover were all at about 220 KV and uh, using using the Nikon Microfocus uh, RT and a 1621 was used across the board. Um, the He did try and scan a, an actual record, um, but it really didn't turn out to be much. Any of the bumps in that, you'd have to break a very, very, very tiny piece off. Um, and at this Point in the presentation, everyone knows about geometric mag. And so if I've got a record spinning around 360 like this, I'm not going to get really high mag. It would have to be really, really close to the face of the x-ray tube. So uh, next one's a model train. So uh, Jeremiah in our lab is a collector of model trains. And 
Um, so the materials in that locomotive are primarily plastic or uh, low density cast materials. And he did have to do a little bit of uh, disassembly. Um, you know, the shell is made of styrene and delrin. Uh, you know, zinc tin alloy is, is for the uh, chassis, which I actually found kind of interesting. I had a, uh, you know, toy trains when I was a kid, but they were all metal, whereas they actually use that, that extra weight. So they keep contact with the, with the rails and the dense components are steel pins and screws. So other materials are brass, copper, and, and uh, printed circuit boards. Um, so this one actually did find something kind of interesting. You know, so we, we scan complex assemblies every day of the week, right? Whether it's a you know, medical device that's assembled, um, you know, actuators or different components that go into, into the aerospace world, the automotive world, you know, the, all of these materials are very common to see in a CT lab. And, um, you know, sometimes people have problems with their parts. In this case, Jeremiah actually bought, bought one of these trains online. There's a particular one he was looking for. And, um, you know, the, the drive gears would, you know, bind or stop. And, you know, what, what he found is that he was actually missing one. Um, and of course, you know, who sold it to him didn't anticipate it was going to get CT scanned. Um, but that work, that worm gear was, was missing. Um, so it ran at about half the power, half the speed, um, which, which was very, very interesting. Um, and so with that, Jeremiah also threw together a, a pretty cool video here. So with the multiple scans, I believe he basically overlaid these within within volume graphics. So the you know the low density and the high density, as well as the the total scan, so that you can surface things differently. You know, for more for show than anything else. Um, but that's not uncommon for you know customers to need this this level of information, especially if they're reverse engineering something. All right, so um, technique info. So he's 220 across the board. Um, and then, uh, you know, reflection on the whole train. Uh, he used the RT on the plastic scan and the uh, reflection on the metal. So honestly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab at it and say that was probably availability that day more than a technical selection, which anybody that has a few x-ray machines that that's also a, a real world situation all right the xbox so i think justin presented this at uh as t digital maybe um this is kind of a cool story so you know different people different passions so justin is dominant at fantasy football and at gaming <laughs> and um uh, so in the early 2000s, the Microsoft Xbox had an issue called the Red Ring of Death. They, you know, after they shipped these parts out, basically didn't anticipate that some of these gamers were going to sit there and play on their machine for, you know, 12, 14 hours at a time, and it would end up heating up. And so there was cracks in VGAs or cracks in the, the circuit card that would open up when they're warm, close up, uh, open up, close up. Um, and so the uh, it was known as the red ring of death because there was basically four uh, red quarter circles that would light up. And when all four of them were, were lit up, your uh, system was dead. Cost Microsoft a little over a billion dollars to fix this problem uh, that very likely could have been caught earlier on with um, some CT scanning. So Justin bought one off of eBay. Uh, unfortunately for the the testing we did it was not a, a failed one um but you know this is you know very analogous to a, a something we do every single day you know we look at printed circuit boards and you know you've got that high and low density 
navigation. Um, you've got uh, the, the size of that card versus the resolution that we want. If we've got a big card, that can be a challenge. Um, you know, identifying and locating those those issues or those breaks. Um, you know, the the issue causing the red ring of death was that PCB would get hot when it was used, it would cool down, be hard to hard to find, and the solder the solder balls on the board were not designed for that repeated cycling um, that resulted in cracking. So here's a video that Justin came up with, and this is of course mocked up in in VG. Um, And they did do uh, multiple scans. I think they did a, a, an extract or a laminography on the, the board, um, as well as a, an overall. So if you're looking for head and pillow or something like that, that's really where that um, laminography, which I, I didn't touch on. I, I know the presentation was going to get a little long the way it is, but you know, laminography is basically an x-ray tube here, detector here, and we move them in this type of a fashion rather than a full rotation. So you can get very, very high magnification on a you know, 8, 10, 12, 15 inch circuit card, but you can still get very close to the x-ray tube. Um, so technique information, so the whole box scan at 220 using the RT, using a, a PE or Perkin Elmer, uh, which is now Varex. Uh, the shell scan, uh, so again, at, at 220 using the, the RT in the 1621. And the motherboard uh, BGA scan. So we used an X, extract uh, 60 uh, degree scan angle and about 160 kV and um, a 2520DX panel. And that's that's all I've got. So any questions, thoughts, um, you know, by all means, you know, add it, add it to Karen or, or George in the chat and I'll be happy, happy to field them best I can. I think so get on. I was uh Karen, you're muted. <clears throat> yes, I am. I'm just checking to make yeah. sure you're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a minute to get on. I All was, right, everyone's uh, gotta wake up now. <laughs> I've been eating potato chips and uh watching watching the uh the the presentation. That was very good, Ben. I I really enjoyed that. Um anyway, so I had uh potato chip in my mouth, had to finish chewing it before i got online <laughs> <laughs> you ended too fast <laughs> yeah yeah very well I done should have, i should have put a stack light on the side so everyone knows when to wake up right <laughs> yeah well uh karen are, are, do the attendees can they chat because it looks like i'm not sure they have access to the chat yet um <sighs> There's also there is the question and answer box, and I don't know if we can maybe, uh, yeah, there you go. You can probably get give permissions or something. Well, I'm trying to. I'm allowing everyone to talk. However, they've got to do the same thing I did, and unmute themselves if they want to ask a question. The chat box is open you know, I was looking at the chat box to for me to send a chat I can only send a chat right now to host and panelists mm -hmm. so I don't know that that doesn't necessarily mean they can't send it to us also but
No, oh, technology is good stuff once we get it worked out, details worked out. Well, so uh, <clears throat> your expert skier video you had there, Ben, that was your youngest, right? That Yes, that is Teddy. Yep. He's, uh, yeah. So he'll he'll be starting in the in the ski club this year. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Yeah. yeah. I, um, snow skiing is not anything I've ever I've done. So hmm. one of those days I'll have to uh, join you up there and see if I can keep from breaking a leg or something. Yeah. Br bring it on. Yeah. It's. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I certainly enjoy it. Enjoy teaching it. Um, yeah. It's it's been a lot of fun. So I was what the I used to work when I when, decades ago I worked for uh, the railroad indirectly I was contract under a contract with the railroad Burlington Northern and yep. uh, Memphis Tennessee when I went to uh, University of Memphis and uh, so I unloaded automobiles but anyway the reason I brought that up the uh, I thought the rendering of the volume graphics on that that uh, rail the the train engine was awesome and it was also uh uh from what i understand that is was that color correct i mean didn't the yes. uh, the actual green was the burlington northern yeah. green so yes yeah. so that was um actually my my dad retired as a conductor from Bur from the bn um so yeah that, that was absolutely correct so um actually showed that showed that to my dad because jeremiah is a significant train enthusiast so yes yeah, that was that was that was beautifully done and uh you know was, i've uh that takes a, an additional skill to to be able to pull all that kind of stuff in we don't normally do that i guess in our regular everyday inspections but that's uh, anyway i was impressed with the with that for sure yeah it was very impressive i i really like the way that it, we could slice it in both directions and and see things but i did have you mentioned uh flight hardware and aircraft or rocket parts so how do you qualify your systems and your team to reach the approvals from the clients? Sure. So um, tip, most of the aerospace customers have some kind of a, um, on the team side, most of them expect NAS 410. Um, so everyone in our office that's gonna do, do or deliver a CT scan is gonna be a level two or a level three in NAS 410. Um, and within our written practice, we define, you know, digital x-ray, we define CT, we define these different things and how they're going to be qualified. I mean, the, the traditional testing process go, holds true, whether it would be, you know, mag or UT or, or you know, x-ray, CT, whatever, but they take a general practical and specific so that we're confident that they can find the defects, that they can make a scan, that they um, aren't uh, just a button pusher, but they're, you know, a uh, confident tech that can make a good scan right competent tech is the important rule yep. um so so i see where a project like this would would really hone someone's skill set to you know i mean we, we get used to doing the same type of part or the same type of configuration over and over and over again but having the different mixes of materials would be fascinating i think um so i have something from joe atam and it says i missed the last part of PCBA, how the CT scan helped to find the problem of the death of the ring. How did the CT scan help to find the problem of the death ring? Ah, uh, yes. So the the actual Xbox that we had did not have this defect. Um, but you know, the uh, I can actually just I'll bounce back a couple of um so the uh, issue was the, the PCB was getting too hot when the console was being used. Um, so the solder balls, so these are solder balls. Um, if you had a defective one, um, you would easily be able to see that void or that defect that's breaking apart. Um, not, I'm not an a expert in, in printed circuit boards, but very, very common defects within printed circuit boards is what they call a head and pillow. Basically, it, it literally looks like two of these balls mushed together. Um, and that's the most common way that those things are going to crack. And so I'm speculating a little bit, but if if that would have had head and pillow, we would have seen it. I mean, I think this is fairly good evidence, but that, you know, the eBay Xbox that we bought, you know, you know, 
18 years later, 20 years later, did not have the, the defect we hoped to find. Well, it's a real bummer you didn't get a defective one. I know that's that that's that's part of this, you know, the, these adventures, right? Well, only uh, in our world would that be a, a bummer. Yeah, it's about um, a faulty part. It, it, you got it what is, you paid for. What's up with that, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I will say it's emblematic of an X-ray house or a CT house, and anybody that does CT scanning and probably second this is, you know, you'll have someone come in and say, "I have a problem." And we can x-ray it, make a really good x-ray or CT scan. And you know, I see the list of attendees here. Lots of other people can too. Sure. And um, you know, in aerospace, that's why we want RQIs, right? In critical applications, that that's why we want a known defect. And then I can prove to you I can see it. Right. Um right. so yeah. This we one want that in the maritime know. industry as well. Yeah. There's so I have a question from Alan Sanders. It's a, what type of part, material, or configuration are the most challenging? Oof. Um, <laughs> every, everything's got a challenge, right? Um, boy, I don't know. Um, so the, the easy one would be density, right? So if you, and, and by the question, I'm going to guess that, you know, the, you know, we take the periodic table of elements and as I go down and as I go to the right, things get more dense. So, uh, you know, there, there are certainly, you know, rocket parts today. Um, there are certainly, you know, defense items today that are getting bigger and thicker and, you know, printed in such a way that eventually you can't get x-rays through it. So we up to, you know, in, in our shop, we go to 450 KV and we have some friends or partners that, that have MEV, um, but even the MEV has challenges, right? So I, I would say thickness and density is probably probably a challenge. Whether yeah, I could spend a month telling you about <laughs> what's tough and challenging. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that answers it. Well, I, I think that that answer, if I asked 20 technicians, I would get 20 different answers for that yeah. one. I mean, that's <clears throat> it's pretty much a loaded question. Yep. That was a good, that's a good question for sure. Yes. I um, love this image that you have up. It, it almost looks like something out of Star Wars. Yeah, it's a uh, BGA's surface really well. They, they surface very, very well. Yes. Okay, so what are some interesting developments that you're seeing for Avonics in 2023? Uh, well, <laughs> Um, so we, I mean, we've certainly been hiring and growing a lot. Um, some of the, the scans that were done here were done on, um, you know, known tube and known x-ray detector combinations, but we've got a couple of new machines that we've built that we're just kind of waiting for a public, public release. That's why I had a, a fuzzy image there. I mean, they're real. I could walk you back to them, but, uh, um, we're going through kind of a product cycle with with Nikon right now, so we'll have have some new models in in the new year for sure. Um, and we're growing quickly, so we're in the process of signing a lease for a new manufacturing uh, site. Um, we've got designs done and that sort of thing. So, Excellent. yeah, new new teammates, new place, and new tools. Well, I look forward to getting another talk with you in the future yeah. about the new things that you're doing. Absolutely. Ellen says, thanks for the answer and thanks for the presentation. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ben. I really appreciate it. Everybody, this awesome is again job. Ben Connors from Avonics. I really appreciate him being willing to donate his time and expertise to help the community. Yeah, absolutely. Well, th thanks again for setting it up. And yeah, I'm sure we'll talk soon. Next week. Yes, we'll, we'll see you in a week. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.